The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to the Center for International Studies. You not only brave the rain, you also have to brave me because you can hear that uh, English is not my mother tongue. And you have to bear with me because the topic I would like to discuss with you <coughs> is uh, somewhat a dry topic to begin with. I'm going to speak about 40 minutes uh, and going through some slices with you. If you start Googling the term sustainability, you will find hundreds of definitions. Uh, for tonight and for the discussion, we just want to follow the one Brundtland gave from the UN Commission, saying that sustainability is, a uh, society is sustainable if it satisfies its needs without limiting the prospects of future generations. Let's keep it simple, okay? Let's keep it simple at that moment. On the other side, you have one money system, which is a monopoly, fiat currency based with the compound interest rate, with the scarcity criteria, created by a private credit bank creation process and backed up by a belief system. And what we're doing is we're bottlenecking all our societal and economic activities from unemployment to global warming, from local farming to education, from healthcare to pension, to international trading through this one monetary system. So the question I would like to discuss with you tonight, with the next 40, 45 minutes, is, is there a link between the money system and sustainability? If so, how does the underlying mechanism look like explaining a recurrent crisis? You know? And is the current political arrangements enough to cope with the challenges ahead. Speaking in an academic environment, I would like to start with questions. In Europe, we start with questions. And the first question I would like to ask you is, where do you think does 95% of the money come from worldwide? Do you have an idea? It's a commercial bank. Commercial private banks are creating 95% of the money on this planet. This is relevant, we will see, with regard to the systems dynamic between the money system and sustainability. Second question. I have three questions for you. And then I start, OK? Second question. What do you think is the cause of the 2008 crisis, financial crisis? <clears throat> is it cyclical? Is it bad luck? Is it managerial? Is it lax political regulation? Or one of the others? What do you think? What do you think is the cause? You know, research, research found, for example, a couple of months ago, uh, Princeton researchers, that shortly before the crisis, there was a cash run on demand for a couple of specific financial uh, products. Basically, so-called ABCPs, asset-backed commercial papers, and brokerage balances. Okay? And every time there is a crisis, we find a story, we find a narrative, which tries to explain us the crisis. I would like to show you later on, it's none of the above. Because is there, when there is a house which is instable, like a house of cards, it doesn't matter from which side the trigger comes. It's going to fall apart anyway. And you cannot identify a specific 
cause for the crisis. Last question. Now it's getting a little bit tricky. <clears throat> what do you think? I give you four possibilities. Which is of the following choices best describes the relationship between networking and integration on one side and sustainability of the monetary system on the other? Depending whether you're a sociologist, or an environmentalist, or an economist, or you're a microeconomist, a macroeconomist, you might come to different conclusions. And there is indeed good evidence that the higher a system is integrated, the higher the financial deepening is, it reduces the risk of a financial default. There's also good data that the higher the networking, the higher the contagion effect is. And there's good data that these two things actually don't get together. But I would like to show you that it's basically C. I'm getting back to all the three questions. Okay, you can just relax now because we passed the test. Let me start with three data. <clears throat> Historically, the 08 crisis was by far the biggest since 1930, but it was not the only one. Since 1970, we had we can monitor 425 total banking crisis, monetary crisis, and sovereign debt crisis, which makes 425 together, which makes 10 countries affected a year. Three quarter of IMF members got affected. So it's not a single event. It's a recurrent pattern. Second data. If you look at the currency market, the currency market is historically the most liquid, the deepest, and the largest market ever in monetary in uh, economic history. The volumes of four trillion US dollars are traded a day. And what do you see here in this graph? The development from 80 to about 30 years of volumes traded a day, accumulated. Out of these four trillion tradings a day to make goods and services in imports and exports all over the world, you only need about 2%. The rest is speculative. Out of four trillion a day, IMF figures. By the way, you know what this dent is? This dent is when the euro got introduced. Okay? All these European currencies got melted together, and we have one more currency, but the game started again. Third data, derivative market. In the year 2000, we started with 100 trillion, raising up to 600 in 2010, IMF figures, which makes a 65% increase a year. Okay, it's eight times world GDP, about. You know, if you use the metaphor of the dog and the tail, you can ask who is the tail wagging the dog or is the dog wagging the tail? Is it a recurrent pattern? Is it systemic? If you had a car, <clears throat> if you had a car with such a track record, of 10 events a year, you might consider to send it back to the designer board. Or you might consider to ask, could it be that there's something wrong with the design? There had been unprecedented losses due to crisis. And empirically, it's really hard to dismantle them because they're all linked together, kind of. But there are three or four properties you can kind of look separately. The first one are output losses. You can measure that. 
The last crisis, the last crisis cost about 14, over 14% 14 of GDP on output losses for the countries affected. You know? another, another cost property is transfer costs. These are costs uh, asking who is paying the bill for the crisis. And it's invariably being the taxpayer paying the bill throughout the last 50 years. And the payment support for deposit guarantees in OECD countries levels about 10% of GDP. You have to add that on top to the 14%. In other countries like Argentina, you had uh, figures 30, 40, 50% of GDP. The third figure is indirect costs. Every crisis, every financial crisis hitting the economy is also hitting the society. And there are three figures we look at all the time. It's the crisis-related poverty rate, the crisis-related unemployment rate, and the crisis-related healthcare outcome. You can measure that. Census data, 2011, USA. One out of four American is at the distress zone or at the poverty level. Children hit most. Unemployment, 27 extra million, 27 million extra on a global level hit by the crisis. I'm just coming from Greece. In Greece, you have a youth unemployment rate of 52%. 52%. This is very expensive. Health outcome. Health outcomes hit by the financial crisis are always pro-cyclical. Pro-cyclicals in the sense that it's partly permanent, partly irreversible, but always worsens corresponding to the improvements during the recovery. You always end up with the worst outcome. For example, Mediterranean countries, now affected. HIV rate increased 52%. OECD data. The increase of major depressions, factor three, published last week. As a rule, thumb rule, you can say a 10% decrease due to a financial crisis causes an eight to 9% increase in maternal morbidity, all right? A very conservative figure can tell you it's about 25% of GDP if a financial crisis hits the society. Okay? And this does not include yet the pension gap, you know, which measures the fund assets on one side to the liabilities. Pre-crisis we had on OECDs, um, figures about 13% difference. Post-crisis, 2009-2010, doubled, 26%. And this is hitting those countries most who have a high pre-retirement income, like France, like UK, partly United States, but especially Germany and Austria. At the end of last year, there was a very interesting report coming out by Lihi Kainen. <coughs> you can Google him. He is the former central banker of Finland. And he gathered a group of experts on the question about the shadow banking system. The shadow banking system is running in parallel to the conventional system. It was hard so far to grab the figures, what's happening in this shadow banking system. It's been increasing even during the crisis. And we're talking about another 65 unregulated, 65 trillion unregulated products. And if you ask the experts in that group, I tell you, you don't get the right answer. What is a CDO? What is an ABO? What is an OTC? What is toxic? What is backed up? What has a proper collateral? You just don't know. We just don't know. So this 2008 crisis left us, I think, in, a very, in the US and in Europe, more than in 
developing countries, in a very bad shape to uh, mitigate two predictable and pretty consensible challenges which are sensitive to the monetary system. It's the transition towards a post-carbon economy and the impact of the baby boomers on society. There's very good research done on this transition towards post-carbon economy showing preventing global warming will cost our society about 1 to 2% of GDP. Fixing the problem afterwards, at least 10 to 15 times more. Baby boomer, similar impact. There are 10,000 turning, 10,000 turning 65 every day for the next 25 years. All going into retirement sooner or later. These age-related additional debts per GDP makes about 25, 30, 50 percent on top of all the problems we have already. This is BIS data, Bank of International Settlement. So both problems, post-carbon economy and baby boomer, they're going to peak within this decade, independent who is in charge politically. And both are not compatible with an austerity program. You know, if a financial system supposed to promote capital development, enhance equity, wealth, strengthen democracy, or expand human capacities, the system failed. The system failed so far. What are the conventional solutions? We're not able to go into this in detail. It takes another two or three hours, or whole seminar series to, spot, to talk on conventional solutions to so solve a crisis. On your left, you just see different proposals from regulatory efforts to privatizations to austerity programs, quantitative easing, Keynes stimulus. We have a Keynes, the only data IMF Keynes stimulus we have is a 14.4 trillion uh, stimulus package to save the economy from a uh, deflationary depression. I just want to show you this graph on your right. What you see here is the difference between the amount of money which is printed or injected into the banking system with this upper graph, Eurozone, US, UK, and the amount of money the banking system took in order to stimulate the economy, which is, over the last five years, below 100%. This is seasonally adjusted to August 2008. So all the money injected in the US, in the UK, in the Eurozone, basically stayed in the monetary system. It didn't get all the way down to the bottom to the real economy. Economists call this a liquidity trap. And with an interest rate with zero, the central banks can just do nothing but printing and printing money to get, for some reason, the economy going. And independent to the measures, you know, the US is uh, going into further regulation, privatization packages, and different forms of Keynesian stimulus. The Europeans are having a mixture of austerity programs. Independent to the measures, we could ask, are we barking up the wrong tree? Could it be that we have to look up whether all these problems we are encountering are systemic to the system we're using? You know, even if there was no crisis, <clears throat> even if there was no crisis the last 30 years, or even if one of the programs I've just mentioned would work, one of them, every time we take a dollar in our hands, every time, 
We go home and take a dollar to buy something on this planet. We are enhancing a non-sustainable way. The given design of the monetary system, this is crucial for my talk and for the discussion. The given design of the monetary system, which is a fiat monopoly with a compound interest rate, speculative, backed on bank debts and on a belief system, is non-sustainable by very nature. There is a very strong, even coming from Chicago, a uh, business school, very, very strong empirical, theoretical, and historical evidence that, for example, the given system is amplifying boom and bust cycles. Whenever there is a boom, they're providing more credits. This is why Reinhardt says, when it rains, it pours. It amplifies the boom and the bust. The given system is not neutral with regard to short-term thinking, with regard to short-term thinking. If you make a survey on CEOs and ask them, what is their perspective in the private field? They will say, 25 years. My children, my education for the children, my grandchildren. This is my investment perspective. And if you ask the same question to the same CEOs and in your business, they're going to tell you three months. And this has a lot to do with a lot of variables. But one variable is the monetary system. Those of you studying economy and go to business school know the standardized discounted cash flow analysis. Any discounted cash flow analysis favors short-term decision making by simple mathematics. 61 US dollar with a 5% interest rate in 10 years makes $100. $100 discounted as from now is only 65 euros worth it now. This is not theoretical. This is not kind of a statement of a nerd. There were times in history where economic systems were using the opposite of an interest rate. This is called technically a demurrage fee. So you don't get interest rate, but you have to pay interest rate if you keep the money in your pocket. So what are you going to do if you have a million in your pocket and you're losing 5%? You're, losing, you're trying to make a very, very long-term investment. Very, very long-term. Historically, there's interesting findings that the cathedrals of the 11th to the 13th century in Europe and also the Asian Egypt cultures were using such a demurrage fee, reversing the investment patterns. Money is not neutral with regard to our growth process. Every ecosystem on this planet, every, there's no exception, follows, in order to be sustainable, an S-curve. Always and only, only S-curve systems can be sustainable. Whenever there is a built-in exponential variable, the system is forced to grow. And this is why in OECD countries, in the US as well as in all other OECD countries, the expenditures, the public expenditures for interest is higher than what we spend on healthcare. This is also why in developing countries, the capital flow from the south to the north, since about 15 years, exceeds the aid from the north to the south by about 150 billion a year. This is why the politicians, the citizens from developing countries borrowing one dollar in the 1990s had to pay back 23. And in the year 2000, 25. So economies are growing blindly regardless of the consequences. Money is not neutral with regard 
to the concentration of wealth. In Europe, and I think partly also in the US, there's a huge debate about how far we can go in the concentration of wealth and how does that affect our community building, et cetera. And there's a lot of reasons, you know, it's about technology and globalization and education and geography and luck and heritage and so forth. So a lot of reasons. But there's also one reason which is distinctively attributable to the monetary system. And there's actually just one single study available in two, from 2007 on that question done by the Deutsche Bank on Deutsche Bank data. They made a survey on 10 income groups of households and found out that the lower eight income groups are permanently transferring interest payments to the upper one. This is not due to clever, cleverness. This is not due to industriousness. This is only due to the design of the money system. And money is not neutral with regard to social capital. You know, Putnam showed that for democracies. Fukuyama showed that for markets. Markets and democracies functions best when the social capital is high. And the question was, it's very hard to measure. What is social capital? Is it about spatial proximity, about religion, about neighborhood, about language? No. It's about trust. It's about responsibility. It's about fairness. You know, and you can measure ex with, within an experimental design any time when the given money system is present. It's about greed and fear, intolerance. It's not about responsibility. And you can measure that in the brain. The brain regions affected is basically a medial prefrontal cortex and amygdala. And this is the same when you are um, a heroin addict. And the signals are stronger than under heroin, sex or crime, when money is present. Why I'm saying that? Because any time we use the given system we use the given monetary system, US dollar system, euro system, yen system, renminbi system, a monopoly with a scarcity criterion, top down with a compound interest rate. We are not only facilitating exchanges, we are modifying human behaviors. It's not a neutral way, it's not a thermometer where we stick into the water, where we stick into the economy and saying, what is the price? It's changing. It's modifying all our human behaviors. So the continual imposition of a monopoly of this type of currency is affecting our future. So the money system is not only in favor of itself because it's instable, it's not only in favor of society because it's expensive, it's also not even in favor of sustainability because it counteracts in each single transaction in a sustainable way. You know, this is a attractor. An attractor is a process where different variables we've been just describing, just mentioned here, we're describing during uh, this lecture, are converging over time and not necessarily causally linked to each other. You know, it's not about left and right. It's not about liberal or Keynesian. It's not about expert solutions. It's not about whether it fits into uh, the conventional economic model or whether it fits to the political agenda. It's like a sink that sucks up the water from the periphery, from all these variables from the periphery, over the US dollar system, 
through the very design of the monetary system. Let me use a picture for a while. What you see here on your left is the Panama Canal and a monoculture. And what you see on your right is the Hindu Delta and a rainforest. Okay. So river banks, let's use that picture, river banks and dams basically determine where the water is flowing, encouraged and disencouraged. The same is true for the money system. You know, the money system, uh, cu currency, curere, is Latin and means to flow. The money system encourages human activities and disencourage others. It facilitates specific types of commercial flows, but does not support others. So the missing link, the missing link, between the monetary system and sustainability is exactly that. The monetary system is not sufficiently diverse enough. It's the lack of diversity of the monetary system which causes us not to go on a sustainable way. You know, since the 19th century, economics was considered to be a closed system where the equilibrium reflects the most efficient way to allocate goods and services, as long as the system is left undisturbed. If we look at the economic system as an open, adaptive system, not a closed one, as dynamic and not mechanical, as networked with an inflow and an outflow, and not atomized, we end up with the flow network, like the ecosystems like the ecosystems, like the biomass, like the human body. You know? And the ecosystem lasts millions of years. And what's interesting from systems theory and finding in systems theory since about two or three years is ecosystems operate in order to be sustainable along two variables only. It's efficiency and resilience. You know, efficiency is the, th the throughput per time, and resilience is the possibility and the capability to adapt to an external stressor. We describe it in the report more in details with all the references. This is a highly aggregated graph showing you the relation between a system being sustainable or not according to two variables in the ecosystem. Resilience measured by diversity and interconnectedness and efficiency by streamlining, by throughput per time. And nature apparently does rather optimize than maximize. And nature apparently does select not for efficiency, but for a balance between resilience and efficiency tends more towards resilience for all ecosystems on this planning being resilient. So what we're doing right now in, the, in OECD countries, in politics, in media, and also in academics, is we are trying to trim the system to be more efficient. If this is true, we can almost 100% predict the next crisis in the near future. No system will survive along that path. All ecosystems, all ecosystems are sooner or later collapse towards this way and then kind of work themselves all the way up to the window of viability. <clears throat> Let's get more concrete. You know, currently, the money is flowing where there is most profit short term. That's what you learn in 
economic school. Money is not flowing where it's most needed. We have on the global level ILO data last week, 75 million unemployed youth. I can hardly wait another generation until these 75 million people are back or in work, in labor. Why just getting closer to the idea of the monetary ecosystem? Why do we have to pay a taxi driver in Tokyo or a CD from China through the same monetary system in our local bakery, our communal infrastructure? What is a monetary ecosystem? And why do we need it? Money is not a thing, ladies and gentlemen. Money is an agreement. You don't hear that in your textbooks, but it's true. Money is an agreement to use something standardized, getting technical, but sorry, it's a dry topic for a Monday night. To use something standardized as a medium of exchange in a community. And a monetary ecosystem is using something else than bank debts as a medium of exchange. <clears throat> you know, in 1984, there were two systems running in parallel to the conventional um, to the conventional money system. I'm getting back to that. You actually are most familiar with one system you're using, all of you, already. You know which one? There's a system you're all using, all of you, sooner or later, already. It is the frequent flyer miles. The frequent flyer miles is not only a discounting system to fly more. It has become an international corporate script where over 50% of frequent flyers are earned by not flying. It's a medium of exchange running in parallel to the conventional system. Another example is the time dollars. I met Edgar Kahn. A judge, now uh, uh, emeritus from Washington, who was a former writer of the texts uh, for John F. Kennedy. I met him on Saturday, and he is the inventor of time dollar banks. You know what a time dollar bank is? A time dollar bank is a clear electronic clearing system where you exchange things parallel to the conventional system through the medium of exchange of an hour, not of a dollar. There are 300 systems in this country, and since 2012, there are about two to five a week opening in this country, every week. They are reevaluating human capital. They are differentiating between price and value. Another system are the local exchange trading systems. They're running in parallel, starting in Canada, by the way, and in Great Britain, running in parallel to meet unmet needs and demands in the region. The oldest system is the VIR system, W-I-R, you can Google. It's running since 75 years, parallel to the Swiss franc. 15% of the Swiss economy is at some point cleared to the VIR system. And the interesting finding is that this system, which is backed up parallel to the, v, uh, to the Swiss franc, is counter-cyclical. One reason why the Swiss economy is stable. It's apparently not the chocolate and not the cheese. Uh, it's apparently, apart, other, apart from other things, a monetary system running in parallel. 65,000 firms are involved. Anytime the Swiss franc is getting into trouble, unemployment is increasing, the SMEs are switching over to the other system. 
which is a backed up system, backed up by the inventory. Yeah. In Germany, we have over 80 so-called regios. These are complementary currencies running parallel to the euro on a regional level. And you know why? Because some regions in Germany identified that whenever they create wealth in a region, it's leaving the region. There was a study done last year in Chicago about that question. If you put $100 in, in a local firm, or $100 in a food chain. How much of that money stays in the region to create wealth in the region? The 100 bucks in the local firm create $68 staying in the region. The 100 bucks giving to a food chain generates 46, Euro for the, uh, 46 dollars sorry, for the region. Okay? Three weeks ago in Bristol, UK, they started a regio called Bristol Pound because the mayor identified 80% of the wealth created in Bristol City is leaving the city. So instead of bottlenecking all societal endeavors, all economic activities through one system which is recurrently instable, which is extremely expensive and which is not sustainable. A monetary ecosystem which tailors and customizes the needs and demands for the region through alternative currencies running in parallel can actually meet these activities. Having such a system in place would mean that we generate a win-win situation for all agencies involved. You know? For the investor, for the banks, for the central banks, for the politicians, for industry, and for the citizens. Through different avenues. When I speak to um, NGO activists, or to um, politicians or academics, I sometimes uh, get the feedback that we are at a fork. A fork ahead where we have to make a decision. And one way leads to more ecological degradation, social unrest, increasing concentration of wealth, more crime, more greed, more short-termism. And the other one leads into a sustainable future. And complementary currencies are part of this other way. Let me summarize. We have, empirically, an evidence-based recurrent crisis which are instable and expensive for all societies. Entire governance and economies. The system is non-neutral with regard to human behaviors. Anytime we take a dollar or you are or you're in our hands, we are enhancing a non-sustainable way. Short-termism, forced to grow, pro-cyclical tendency, income disparity, social capital. Very good empirical data for all the five. Good theoretical grounds, and very good historical grounds. Systems theory can show that to make a system long-term sustainable requires a balance between efficiency and resilience. At the moment, we're running down the path of efficiency. We don't grab that the whole thing has to be balanced out between resilience and efficiency. We got to start to think outside the box. And a monetary ecosystem can do that. You know, H. Wells said history is a race between education and catastrophe. There's a lot to learn. You know, for the wealthy elite, that concentration of wealth and political stability don't go together. For academics like us, we have to start to think 
outside of the box. We have to start to reconsider our assumptions. We have to start to reconsider a mental switch. Last. Quoting, I have to quote a German sociologist, Georg Simmel, you might know. The debate, he wrote a book called The Future of Money, 110 years ago. It's worth it reading. It's available in English. The debate on the future of money is not about inflation or deflation, fixed or flexible exchange rates, gold or paper standard. This is what we're discussing in the academic field, ad no nausea, but about the kind of society in which money is to operate. If we want, this is what we discussed this morning, if we want to fly to the Mars or invent a pension chip, we still need the conventional money system. If we want to overcome unemployment, we might need another one. There is no society who can cash in totally for raising a child, safe neighborhood, preserving nature, overcoming unemployment, and taking care of elderly through one monetary system. And that's the link. If you're interested in reading more about it, there are several translations available, including a English primary version since a couple of months. Thank you very much. <coughs>
I didn't see any real problem than Bitcoin clearing system being used for drug dealers or making money out of it with cashing in. So the societal value of Bitcoin, I didn't fully grab yet, though it's very clever. The electronic way to set it up, the design is clever, yeah? but at the end, it's not a currency. Uh -huh. The relationship between the, um, the fiat monetary system and you know, the machinations of the external, which is really quite fascinating. And um, you used the example of the airplane miles. Yeah. And I'm, I'm jumping between a couple of points, but uh -huh. the, trying to get from below to these populations who might not have access to airplane yeah, yeah, yeah. If if we had more time, uh, I would could offer you some graphs about the systematics. You have transnational ones, international ones, international corporate scripts. The best example is a, a, a frequent flyer mile. You have national ones, regional ones, local ones, functional ones, depending what you want to achieve. So the point for me or for us with an academic field. Tackling with sustainability issues is simply we got to get out of the trap that the given money system is really helping us out there. You know, post carbon economy, which is huge in the next decade, hitting the US just as well as any European state. Okay, baby boomer, huge amounts of liquidity required to solve. Okay. There's no austerity pro, uh, program capable to do that. Mayor Bloomberg in New York started launching time dollars because 10,000 every day, turning 65. What are you going to do? What are you going to do every day? Every day. You need a solution. And the solution is not wage cuts. The solution is not further austerity. The solution is not within the conventional system. The solution is not about inflation or deflation. Whether you're going to, be going to have a fixed or a flexible exchange rate. Whether you're going to have a gold standard or another one, or the paper standard. It's about in which society, in which segment of the society, the specific monetary system is supposed to work and to achieve a specific goal. If we want to make international commercial trades, the given system is the best and most efficient there is. There is no doubt. But if we want to solve 52% unemployment in uh, Greece, or a meltdown of communal infrastructure, or educational issues, or healthcare issues, we made a lot of proposals with regard to the healthcare system and with regard to educational systems in the report. We might consider a parallel currency. There was research done by Bucconi University, Mailand. This is Ivy League, Italy. And they found out between 800 AD and 1800 AD in Europe, there were huge amounts of communities which were having two currencies. One for local exchange between you and me and you and me, just to keep the community together and one for international exchange. Whenever the community started exchanging with some foreigners they didn't know, they needed a specific unit of account, basically a gold standard, everybody could agree on, to exchange. But you don't need that in a community if, it, if it's done properly. And if nowadays with the IT, with the information technology, these clearing systems are so easily to set up there's no fraud. There's no misuse. Everything is cleared, and you can, you can follow up every single um, exchange compared to the figures in the shadow banking system, where we have a 65 trillion open bill. I tell you, nobody knows. You can ask the representatives of business school. They're not going to tell you. Shadow banking was one of the one of the big macroeconomic uh, developments, 
probably explaining the great moderation of the 80s and 90s in the economy. Okay? Because the variables in the, uh, the, the parameters in the conventional system uh, kind of smoothened out, inflation rate in the 80s and unemployment rate, et cetera. But the money, the play, the game, played basically in the shadow banking system. You know? Very likely. It's one explanation for it. Take my prerogative as uh -huh. moderator to ask the last question. Uh -huh. um, what's to keep the monetary ecosystem itself stable, itself sustainable? Why would it not simply be to the extent that it captures or that these alternative forms, that these alternative value regimes capture a kind of value? What's to prevent that from being reduced to the conventional monetary system? Mm -hmm. If um, yeah, you know, if you think of the history of value, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. there have been many kinds of regimes of value circulating. Mm -hmm. That uh, were called alternative um, mediums of exchange, or uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, without even a, a specific medium of exchange, but that yeah. have been reduced to exactly the conventional yeah. monetary system yeah. historically. So uh -huh. what's make these efforts more yeah, I think if we, it's a very good question, thank you. I think if we understand that a fiat currency currently in charge with a compound interest rate and speculative by nature is creating such instability, if we understand that, okay, and keep that in our mind, then we can start thinking about alternatives. And there are 4,000 complementary currencies already low scale on the global level in charge. They're working. It, they show that it works. It's a little bit like the brother writes 110 years ago, you know, when they met and said, we're going to fly. Everybody in the audience laughed, 1911 or 1990. Now flying is a standard procedure. I have the feeling that within the complementary currency uh, community, we are at that stage, I think. <laughs> well, that's hopeful now. Uh, please um, join me in thanking um, Dr. Bernard and uh, join us in the, for the reception in the back of the room. Yeah, thank you. The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.